Work. It isn't the most important thing in life, but for most of us, it's a really big deal. Welcome to Planet Work. We're here to help you get more freedom, money, and fun out of work, because a better life begins with a better career. Top of the morning to you. How are you today? Welcome to Planet Work. My name's Kat Breed, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. I'm actually thrilled to introduce you to our special guest. Our topic for the day is influencing without authority. And we're gonna talk about, well, first of all, why bother? And second of all, the really cool things that can happen for you in your career and your life if you start doing that, influencing without authority. So um, if you've ever heard that phrase, do the job to get the job, and you've been scratching your head wondering, how do I do that? Kurt Schmidt has got the answer. So let me tell you a little bit about Kurt and then we'll bring him on the show to talk with us today. Okay, so Kurt has built a career by influencing without authority. I mean, after all, he had the audacity to start a podcast three years ago. What made him think he was, you know, credible enough to start a live show? Like, you know, me last year, LinkedIn live show. Anyway, enough on that. Let me tell you a little bit about Kurt and then he'll come on with us. So he began his career as well, he'll tell you how he began his career, his first career before getting into technology. Um, wind the clock forward in 2016, Kurt took over 20 years of experience in software design and started a revolutionary new software design agency called The Foundry. Today, as the president, he is proud to tell you, well, he doesn't talk about it much, but I'll tell you, his company has more than quadrupled in size and now sits very comfortably on the 2020 Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies list. He also moonlights as the host of The Schmidt List. And uh, I had a ton of fun with him on there a couple of weeks ago talking about fear and how that stands in your way at work. But today he's here to talk with us again about influencing without authority. Let's get him on. Kurt, good morning. Hello, Kat. How are you? First I'm of all, I am so honored to be here. I really enjoy your show. I try to catch it as much as possible. You yourself are an inspiration um, and uh, to me in doing my show. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you. Well, thank you. Thrilled to have you. Okay, so before we talk about influence without authority, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. I saw a really fun blog at the Foundry website a couple of weeks ago about bikes. It was called Meet My Bike. <laughs> you weren't on there. Nope. Where was you? Where's your bike? Well, I, I don't. I, you know, I want to. I want to make sure the staff gets their 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 glory. My glory was many many years ago. Um, but yeah, no, I started. I uh, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I loved Evil Knievel, and uh, I couldn't afford a motorcycle, so I had my BMX bike, and uh, I learned how to jump it. And I uh, got. Uh, I met some friends, and we went BMX racing a lot. And then I got into BMX freestyle, which was jumping off ramps. And then I turned professional when I was uh, 19 or 20 and uh, shortly thereafter started a bike company and uh, then kind of retired around, you know, ripe old age of 26 from professional competition. And then you got into software design. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that bike, that bike company taught me a lot about business and the areas of business that I thought um, was the most interesting. And that was the technology side of things. So I can't resist asking you. So you became a professional BMXer at the age of 19. I've got a son who just turned 18. He graduated from high school. He's flying the coop. And he asked my <laughs> husband this question a couple of weeks ago. What do you wish you could tell your 18 year old self? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put that question to you. Oh, man, I would say um, I would say keep doing what you're doing. Like I was pretty unafraid. I, I don't know what if, if it was just being super naive <laughs> about the world. Um, but uh, I, you know, I kind of felt, you know, that I could get a lot. Uh, I, if I put the work in, I knew I could get results. So, and hey, good morning to everybody that's joining us this morning. Hey, Rachel, Rebecca, hello, hello. Um, pop your comments, your questions 
I want to know what your experience is. So as Kurt and I unfold our conversation, I want you to think about moments in your career when you were able to influence without authority and what impact did that make in your career and your life? So with that, let's start with you, Kurt. So I want you yeah. know share with us the first time that you, um, and we'll we'll table BMXing for our next chat. Sure. Let's, let's talk about <laughs> software design, corporate America, blah yeah. blah blah. Yeah, blah blah when blah. When is the first time that you realized you could influence without authority? Yeah, no, I, I thank you for for asking that because it was it was it wasn't something I. I realized that I could define until I was a bit older. Um, but as I got older and I started working in a larger agency, um, I noticed uh, where my peers seemed to be struggling. And I, I noticed that they were great at managing teams, but managing across and then managing up was a challenge for some. And I felt super at ease managing up and managing peers managing clients. Uh, I wasn't afraid of any of those those things. And I realized over time that it, it became kind of a superpower, to be honest, was to be able to, uh, you know, manage a team is very different than managing your boss. And so being able to influence those people to buy into your ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, and I want to be clear, this isn't about manipulation, right? That's a that's that's with a, a you know a dark intent or something. Um, this is about getting buy into your ideas. This is about getting people to get on board with um, helping you with the tasks that you need to do. This is about getting people to help you do your best your best work. Honestly, it isn't about um, being fake or being in charge. We need to be able to um, get help to produce the, the 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 size of impact that we want to have in organizations and that's what influencing without authority really means to me so can you remember the first time you <laughs> um acted on and used your superpower and made a, a big impact at work i would say i you know honestly i would say by getting my boss to believe that some of my ideas were his ideas <laughs> was you know um you know making it their idea you know like hey we should do this thing and um because uh, you know in the past you know you come in I'm going to do this big presentation. I'm going to present this plan. I'm going to present this big, impactful thing, and everybody's going to see it and go, "Oh my gosh, we should have, we should do this immediately." Let's all switch gears and uh, start swimming that way. And I remember doing that early on, and and wondering, you know, leaving those things, wondering why that wasn't working. Why weren't people? jumping on board. I made it so obvious. I had the data. I had the testimonials from clients. I had all the information. It should have been really simple for people to look at that and say, oh, you know, uh, let's do that. But no, they all had their own agendas. They all had their own fears. Uh, they all had their own uh, sort of uh, way of solving problems. And so what I realized was is that it had to be sort of a groundswell. And one of the things that I wanted to do was sort of change the way we worked uh, with clients. We were very waterfall at the time, and I wanted to change it to something a bit more iterative, which you know eventually in the years later, you know, became Scrum and Agile. And a lot of people were really confused by this and weren't really on board with it because that's how their job was defined. And that's how they were uh, compensated. So changing the way we worked was very difficult. And what I did was instead of doing the big presentation, which I had done before, is we started getting wins. And I realized that if I could get the clients to want it, the company would want it. And so I started working with clients kind of secretively um, on this way of it, doing it iteratively. And, uh, and we got successes. We got more work from them. And I remember the boss coming in and saying, you know, what, what's this thing we're doing here? And I'm like, well, it's this experiment. I don't know if you're going to like it, you know, and, uh, and they did. And uh, I remember at the time thinking, yeah, instead of going in and doing this big presentation and proving to everybody that my ideas were correct, if I could do it a bit more iteratively, if I could create some groundswell, 
if I could understand what made my peers successful, if I understood what my boss's goals were, what really drove them, right? Not just what they told me, you know, but, uh, or at least what they said in big meetings. Like if I really got to know them a little bit better as a person, I could get an idea of like how to deliver them some wins uh, that would then help me in my career, help lift me up as well. So yeah, I would say that was a big, big lesson. So, I mean, I got six points here from what you just shared, where to go. Um, I want to start with fear. Uh, so you yeah. had me on the Schmidt list. Yes. I love the name of your show, by the way. Thanks. So. My wife named it. My wife named <laughs> it's it. It's a great name. She did. She, she thought I was going to first call it the Schmidt show uh, because that's what building software can be like at times and, uh, and developing your career. Uh, but somebody had already taken that name and my wife said she thought it would be funny for me to call people and ask them if they would would be on my Schmidt list. And so that's stuck. So. <laughs> well, I love it. So <laughs> I want to zero in on fear. Um, a couple of things here. So fear, because you brought me on your show to talk about, I mean, like, let's be honest, at the root of all failed software development product projects, yeah. very often is fear, fear of change. 100%. Um, I actually interviewed a change manager in Australia uh, a couple of weeks ago. She's coming on my show soon. And she is uh, involved in agile change management. Mm -hmm. And Kurt, you know this, there are so many companies that are still stuck in waterfall. I hired my first agile developer like 18 years ago. Yeah. What is wrong? Yeah. Fear, fear of change, Hundred percent. fear of um, trying new things, fear of failure. So, um, you know, how do you influence people yeah. who are afraid? Yeah, and that, I'm really glad you, you brought that up, Kat, because there's nothing, if people talk about, I've been talking about digital transformation for years. Here's the secret. There's nothing digital about digital transformation. It's all cultural transformation. It's all changing people to swim a new direction or to be compensated in a new way or rewarded in, in new ways. And that's scary. Change is scary. You know, especially in today's world where, you know, just last year we had 30 million people out of work and, you know, the economy is doing this and this all the time. And so people are not um, not excited about the opportunity to lose their health care. <laughs> it's a really scary time. So, you know, coming in and wanting to upset the apple cart or make change is not usually people's first uh, goal. You know, what their first goal is, is to find stability. And to find and and it's a perfectly natural human trait. I I totally understand that. But the companies need to understand if they can't disrupt themselves, they then are going to be disrupted. So uh, you know you've got to be able to create a culture where you can uh, make sure people don't feel as afraid that by pushing boundaries that they're going to lose their job. You know, we used to talk about it years ago. How do we reward failure? And it seems like a, I don't know, it seems like a hard thing to think about, but as a leader, you don't have to necessarily answer that question, but you need to keep that question in mind because you know that your team, there is some fear there. There is some fear about bringing up new ideas. There always will be, and there always has been. So if you could create a safe space for those ideas to come out, it doesn't mean that we have to act on those things or that those ideas now define that person. Uh, it's just about creating a safer space for those employees. And so any leader out there that's not working their tail off every single day to create a safe space, I won't be surprised if they lose their job in the next few years because they weren't pushing the needle and, uh, and, and creating a safe space and creating more innovation. Yeah, um, that's uh, so to those of you that are listening in this morning and you are leaders, uh, team leaders, business leaders, what have you, um, hit rewind and listen to that again. Um, you must embrace change, but you've got to make it safe for your teams to take yep. some risks and fail and um, and yep. not beat them up, you know, man. So so um, to those of you that are with us this morning, good morning. So Lenny and um Steve and Tanya, Rebecca, hello, hello. We want to hear from you. We've got about 15 minutes left with the amazing, the one, the only Kurt Schmidt. <laughs> we want to hear your stories. Tell us about a time when you influenced without authority. 
And what was the impact in the business? And while you're thinking about that, I want to ask Kurt, tell me about um, the most unsafe environment you've been in and what did you do in that situation? Because let's be yeah. honest, there are a lot of bad bosses out there. There is. Um, I worked for one. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you, but I was 24 and I got caught hiding from an SVP. She was so mean and scary. So, you know, people that are tuning in might right now be in an environment where failure is beaten up. What do you yeah. suggest to them? Should they just up and quit? Sometimes yes, but sometimes yeah. not. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's first your story about a time when you worked for a horrible boss. What did you do? And what advice do you have people for people that are in that situation right now? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, the, one of the I probably have learned more from the bad leaders I've had. Right. I mean, I'm sure that people watching this have had some questionable leadership in their past. And, you know, it's it's kind of a rite of passage. You got to get through those bosses in order to figure out how you're best going to lead on the other other side because sometimes seeing the worst side of leadership makes it pretty obvious what the best side of leadership is and for me uh you know having bosses that just didn't understand what your value was which is pretty common to be honest it's more common than you you might think uh, they don't understand the value that you're creating. That was one of the things that helped me understand what created a bad boss too, was is the, the way that they communicate it, right? I mean, there's a book out there, um, I quote on the show quite a bit, the love languages, right? You know, figuring out what your boss's love language is, even if they're horrible boss, you know, you might be able to figure out like, what are the ways that they, uh, you can spark their curiosity or their interest uh, in a way where you can get through to them to have uh, open and honest conversations. But yeah, to your point, Kat, if it's a toxic environment, we really need to think about getting out of there because it's not even just about bad boss, but you might have bad peers, right? I mean, I know someone recently who has an employee that screams and yells in meetings and like throws things and slams things down. And I look at that and I'm like, if the boss is allowing that to happen, um, they're never going to shut it down. You know, they're, they're, it will be that way and you'll be stuck with that person for the rest of your time there, you know, because again, like that person isn't going to leave. They're in a very comfortable spot where they can kick and scream, literally kick and scream. And uh, they're not going to go anywhere. They, they love it there. They can really explore the space. Uh, but yeah, bad leaders, <laughs> I would say. They can know. fly their bully fat flag yeah. all but, day long. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yep. So, and um, that's why I said like the influencing part is really important because you can't just go in and demand and say, my ideas are better than yours. Um, you need to, and people say like, well, I had an employee once say when I talked to them about getting better at this, they were like, well, I don't want to play politics. And I said, you know, you can call it, whatever you want, you know, uh, you can, I can label it whatever I want. And if I put it in a negative label, yeah, it's going to be negative. So you have made that choice. I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's so funny. I teach negotiation a lot um, as a speaker and I always open up with, tell me about something you negotiated in the last week. And at first people are looking at me like uh, nothing. I'm here to learn how. And I'm like, oh yes, you did. Do you got kids? You negotiated laundry, taking out the yep. garbage, mowing yep. the lawn, got a partner. You negotiated who's going to go to the grocery store, who's going to, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're negotiating all day long. Yep. You're influencing. Yes. Um, and yep. um, so it's an important skill to get uh, and to have, you know. It is. Um, so I cannot believe you mentioned the five love languages. I love that book and I read it probably 18 years ago before they came out with the one for work mm. and it changed my marriage dramatically. Sure, the truth yeah. of the matter is my husband had figured me out. I hadn't figured him out yet. And the book was like, Oh my gosh, figured out his love language. It was great. Yeah. And then I started using it with my kids and then I started taking it to work. And so that book, you guys, it's brilliant. It's, it's really about helping you understand what makes people feel appreciated. Yep. And if you can figure that out with your boss and your coworkers, you can immediately eliminate the defensiveness and the fear and just, you'll watch people like lean in to whatever thing you're trying to get done. It's really right. powerful. Right. Um, if you want to get your best work done, you got to get over yourself 
first. A lot of people think, oh, I've got to be the smartest in the room. I've got to have the best PowerPoint. I've got to have all these things. No, what you need to be able to do is be able to work well with other people. They will help you get to where you need to, to go. So the more the more you understand, to your point, Kat, the more you understand the things that excite them, the more you can get them back on your team and help you produce your best work. Yeah, but you got to check that ego at the door. It's so hard to do. So um, we've got comments and thoughts coming in here. So Lori says, shout out to Gary Chapman and the love languages. She's also a big fan. Um, Debbie talking about the bully flag. <laughs> she says, oh my gosh, that bully flag. Um, yeah. uh, whoops. So there's Lori. Now let's share uh, Debbie here. Uh, that bully flag waves in a lot of companies and the elephant in the conference room yep. can really cause trouble in the cubicle. And so it's about leaders. It's about leaders yep. not tolerating that kind of behavior. And, and I know we've all been overwhelmed and overworked and COVID has been terrifying, but we're coming out of it, folks. And it's time to op take off the blinders and look around and see what's been going on in your company. Um, so let's talk a little bit about culture. Oh, before we talk about culture, Margaret's got a thought about measuring. Mm. So she says, sometimes it's difficult to measure the impact of influence because mine has always been about avoiding catastrophes. So she's a firefighter. Yep. Um, how do you talk about that with employers? The yeah. impact I, of influence. Yeah, I can give you. I can give you a number of things. Uh, well, you know, one of the things is obviously um, being comfortable with sharing the work that you're doing and taking credit for your work. One of the things that I see people struggling with is that because their job, like for years, I was a, a project manager, so my getting things out on time on budget was basically kind of kind of my job. So I never thought that when we launched things that were on time on budget that they should be celebrated. You know, it was just kind of, that's your job. You're doing your job. And these were the stories that I was telling myself. But what I didn't realize is that it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that it was rare, but it was a pretty big deal uh, in the larger organization to be someone that got these things on, on time, on budget, on a regular basis. So working with my teams and promoting the teams that were I was working with, in getting these things, I was taken along with them, right? So I would I would highlight these developers and these designers that were doing such amazing work. I would go around and I would make sure I promoted them um, and they would take me with them. They'd say, well, you know, Kurt was the project manager. I mean, he kept a really good eye on the client. And so by going around and being able to celebrate these other employees on this part of this project or this team that I was on and letting people know how amazing they were, um, I was just naturally brought with them. And that was one way that really helped me build more influence within the organization because the developers and designers saw that I was, a, 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 you know, an ally, someone um, that was rooting for them, you know, but at the same time, the, uh, the, the leadership saw that these were people that respected me and wanted to work with me. So, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about going around and just, uh, tooting my own horn. It was trying to help empower other people to toot my horn for me. <laughs> yes. And the best way to do that is to do good work first yes. and, uh, and help them look good. So I sold IT consultants for years. And the one story that I heard very, from my boss very early on that just was burned in my psyche was she said, making it as a consultant is one part having the right skills and experience and 99 parts the soft skills. And that's what you're talking about. And so to be successful, you need to understand what other people need and want from you and how to influence them. And my favorite story was a consultant named Gary. He was a mainframe programmer. And I know you know what that is. I like the mainframe, so he was a mainframe programmer. And he was out at one client who loved him so much, they kept renewing his contract and they mm -hmm. renewed his contract at like 80 bucks an hour, which was a fortune 25 years ago. Yeah. Kept renewing his contract. And three years after three years, they said, we don't want to let him go, but we're out of budget. We got to let him go. And all the salespeople were fighting over him because this consult, this client kept him for three years. So they were all fighting over him and they placed him immediately on a new assignment as a mainframe pro programmer. Yeah. The new client called the sales rep about a week later and said, is this a joke? 
this guy can't program his way out of a paper bag. What is this? And she said, what? Yeah, he's terrible. He doesn't know how to program mainframes. Get him out of here and I want my money back. And she's like, what is going on? So she called her previous client and said, this is a little awkward for me to call you, but what exactly did Gary do for you for the last three years? And the former client said, oh, don't use him as a mainframe programmer. He's, yeah, he's not terrible. Good Gary is the glue that holds the project together and keeps everybody motivated to hit our deadlines. Yep. They paid for him for three years to motivate, inspire, and influence. Mm -hmm. um, so yep. immediately ripped him off that assignment, paid the client back, and and sat down with Gary, yep. redid his resume, and sold him as a very different consultant. So anyway, yeah, um, and complex work, and and you go back to the space race, you go back to um, going to the moon, you go back to um, the uh, you know I always loved like one of the, my favorite movies is Apollo thirteen. I love those people getting in a room trying to solve the problem, figure out how to do it. Ego is out the door. We need to save some lives. And um, in some of the best companies I've worked in, those are teams that have created trust and accountability with each other. And so, yeah, so if, if you're struggling with that, you've got to get it. That's how you're gonna produce your best work. And if you, if you don't see a path forward at your organization, you know, like it's always good to go out and figure out what your market value is. It is, it is. And coming from a, a president of a company to say that, it's true. And he knows his best people are getting headhunted all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Lori says, I love it. Uh, she's just egging everybody on. And she said, listen, if ego driven on stage performers, I don't know any of those, can figure out how to check the ego at the door and get a sharing focus, you can do it. So she's just saying, yes, you can okay. learn to influence without authority. Um, so Curtis, we're wrapping things up today. I, do you remember one of the scariest times in your career when you, you, you wanted to influence, but you were really afraid of getting fired for it or getting yeah. smashed down. Oh. So you got a story along those lines? Oh, I've got a great story for that. So <laughs> uh, this was with a client, not necessarily a boss, but uh, we we had gone into this um, large organization. I won't say the name of it, but we had gone in and said, you know, um, the executives were saying, you know, we want to create this this thing. We want to create this app, this software that these, these people are gonna love. And we're like, how do you know? And they're like, well, because we've done all the research. I was like, well, have you talked to any of these, these actual uh, customers? And they're like, we don't need to, we have the data. And I was like, that's a bad idea. And they were like, well, if you're not gonna build it, if you're not the person to build it, you're not, the, whatever. And, uh, and so I hemmed and hawed because we really wanted the project. It would have been really impactful. But I was really scared that they were going just based off of uh, you know their gut instinct uh, and, you know, to be honest, some, uh, some white male ego was helping drive uh, a bit of that conversation of that. We know best. We've done this for years. And what I ended up doing was I created a leadership lunch um, where we were going to celebrate these leaders. There was some sort of other event going on. And we were like, hey, we're going to celebrate these leaders. Uh, and we sent invites to all of them to say, come down. We're going to build we're going to build a lunch for you you know, to celebrate you and all these things. And then what we went out is to the customer base and we said, hey, we're going to throw a customer appreciation lunch. And we really want you to come because the leadership really wants to hear from you on the impact and things that you, know, you, were, you were doing. And yeah, that day I was scared to death that they were going to fire me. But what I knew was going to happen was I had been doing this long enough that if I would have gone down the path of just building this in six months to a year, they would have fired me anyways, because I would have built something that they told me that was the thing to build, but I knew that the customer wouldn't have used it and guess who was going to get the blame? It wasn't gonna be them. So uh, I remember specifically the CTO in the organization pulling me aside at the lunch saying, I know what you did here and it turned out amazing. They, we, we had given the people who had showed up and said, Hey, we're thinking about building this thing that does this. The leader sat down across from them, broke bread and said, you know, Hey, we're, you know, we're, and, and it was just a great conversation. And all these leaders walked away with all these new ideas that were theirs. They weren't theirs. They were the customer ideas. And, uh, and the project turned out really well. And we worked with them for, 
and we still, yeah, it's been years and years and years, but I would say there's just certain times where, yeah, if you have to bet your job um, in order to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're doing your best work, like those times are going to come up very often, but when they do, that's an important thing to realize how much influence, how much influence have I bought or have I brought up here, yeah. um, you know, or how much have I banked over so, time? As we wrap it up, the million dollar question in 30 seconds flat, how do you do the job to get the job? <laughs> you know, to be honest, it's really under, you know, if I could put it in one word, reciprocity, you know, um, treat others like how you want to be treated, um, put other people in front of you, you know, but only to a certain extent. Right. Figure out who the bullies are and, and don't be don't be helping them get that promotion anyway. So, Kurt, hey, thank you so much. I know you're a very busy guy and you've got a huge, successful business to run. So um, keep on doing that and thank keep you. on riding those bikes. And well, I appreciate um, it, Kat. Yeah, I love your show. I, I catch it as often as I can. It's fantastic. I love the content you do. So please keep up the. You the good work. I'm very inspired by the work that you and your uh, amazing technology husband are doing over there. Uh, thank I just you. think, uh, I just think it's a, it's just such a great add to the community. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you very much. Well, right back at you. I love your show and have a great rest of the week and weekend. And Hey, to everybody who tuned in, if you liked planet work also do us a favor, um, you know, like it, comment, subscribe, yep. share it with your friends. It's all about spreading the word, you know, the Schmidt list, planet work. We are all out here bringing amazing guests to make your life better. Having help a good us. time doing it. Help us help more people. It is kind of fun. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of the day.